All right, everyone. Welcome to the 56th webinar for the Trees Around the Globe Student Research Campaign. This is going to be the State of the Trees, April 2023, the NASA Surface Water and Open Topography or SWAT mission and how it aligns to water edges and land cover. And we have a great presenter here today from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, Dr. Ben Hamilton, and we will introduce him in several minutes. Um, so thank you for joining. We have folks here from all over the globe community. Looks like we have, you know, maybe eight to 10 countries here right now. So that is wonderful. So thank you all for being here. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat you have for us or for our speakers. Um, when I say speakers, we're going to have Dr. Ben Hamlington. And after that, we're going to have our own Peter Nelson is going to be uh, doing a presentation with some of the really cool things that are, that are coming up with uh, riparian zones and uh, water edges and an upcoming challenge, as well as you know, revisiting this the one week paired tree height and land cover observation, uh, intensive observation period that we did. So let's get started with a couple things here. Uh, I just went through that agenda. Um, after uh, Peter talks today, we have the SIAC survey, um, which I sent out um, a couple weeks ago. Um, for, for anyone who participates in our campaign, in the Trees Around the Globe Student Research Campaign to fill out. But I will put the link back in the chat towards the end of the webinar today. So in case you didn't do it, you can go in and take a look. And it's not, it doesn't take a long time to do, just a couple minutes, um, but it really helps us understand what teachers need and want, you know, in, in, in the sense of the campaign. So it's great for evaluation purposes and planning purposes as well where you guys have a say in, uh, in what we do with these campaigns. So uh, stay tuned for that. All right, so I always showcase these metrics and these metrics are set up to begin when we started the campaign on the 15th of September, 2018. At the same time, the ICESAT-2 satellite launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base, now Vandenberg Space Force Base out in Lompoc, California. But you can see here, we have an increase in measurements each year uh, we have a great amount coming in so far since October 1st of 2022, when year five began. We have uh, almost 21,000 measurements from almost 6,000 global sites with over 13,000 tree height measurements from almost 4,000 global sites, almost 2,500 land cover observations and almost 5,000 green up, green down measurements. And as I say all the time, because I feel I need to, the majority of those green up, green down or greenings protocol observations uh, and, and, and that data comes primarily from the folks who are working with the European phenology campaign with, uh, with Lanka, Barra and Donna. Those are the ones who, you know, really, really get those, uh, those teachers to, you know, to educators and students to take that data and submit it to the GLOBE database. So we thank them for that because that provides just a great wealth of data with tree height, land cover, and greenings, all of those combined, a wealth of data over that last like four and, a five, four and a half years that we've been doing the campaign. Because as you know, a lot of NASA data, when we're looking at change over time, which a lot of the, you know, the earth observing satellites do, these climate change satellites, you know, we look at change over time and kind of that gold standard is like beginning at like five years. So we're closing in on that for the life of the campaign. So I would love to see you know, us hit 200,000 observations, you know, by the time uh, we're at the end of year five, which would be the end of September of 2023. As you can see here, we have uh, just over 145,600 observations coming in from just over 49,000 global sites for the GLOBE program. As you can see here, we've had lots of webinars. We have participants that are that come in uh, from 60 countries and submit the data and interact with us with the campaign. And we have 61 uh, campaign related blogs right now. And we have a, a viewership of this. And we, we've had almost 181,000 views of these 61 blogs. So, you know, very, very cool stuff here. So, all right. So before we get into the, the, the presentation, you know, I just want to show you this. This is NASA's Earth Observing Fleet. And this is as of late January of 2023. And you can see here, Going towards the North Pole right now, we have SWAT, which is our featured presentation today. But you can see a lot of these other NASA Earth observing missions that you are well familiar with, like ICESat-2 and SMAP. And 
several of the Landsat missions, Calypso, okay? And we have, uh, you know, GPM. So we have lots of these, uh, these really cool Earth observing satellites up here. And I always like to show this because NASA does a great job of updating this every time we launch another satellite uh, or instrument into space. So I just want to showcase this. So with that said, you know, we're going to um, go into our featured presentation and it's going to be SWAT. And I'm going to go to this next slide and pass it over to Peter Falcon for an introduction of Dr. Ben Hamilton. If you're talking, you're on mute, Peter. I thought I hit it. Sorry about that. Oh, I was good. saying that's such a neat little postcard that they put together of SWAT. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, yes. Yeah, so so uh, thank you, Brian. Um, I very uh, great pleasure to introduce our one of our speakers today, Dr. Benjamin Hamilton. He's a research scientist here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the sea level and ice groups in the Earth Science section. Um, ben is a member of quite a few science teams here. He's a member of the Ocean Surface Topography Science Team a member of the Grace, Grace FO science team, and he's a current team lead of the NASA Sea Level Change a science team. So he does quite a few things around here, and he also is a very good speaker. That's one reason why we tapped his shoulder. He came highly regarded um, from some colleagues. So I'd just like to turn it over to Ben and say, uh, once again, thank you for, for presenting uh, to us today. Thanks, Peter. And uh, hopefully you didn't raise the bar too high for my, my presentation. <laughs> um, but let me go ahead and share my screen here. Um, and I, I just want to say before I get started, uh, really excited to see such a global audience. This is a really cool. It's um, one of the more international audiences I've ever spoken to. So I'm really excited to bring SWAT to you. For those of you that haven't heard anything about it and can introduce it, I'll put this into, um, I assume you can all see that in presenter mode. Okay. Thumbs up from, okay, cool. Um, so I want to talk to you today about the surface water and ocean topography or SWAT mission. Um, so I'm going to go over a little bit about what SWAT is doing, how it's different and uh, really in advance beyond what we have had up to this point. So SWAT is really doing something that uh, we use the word kind of game changer, revolutionary, transformative, all those different terms. Um, sometimes they're maybe misused or overused. I think for SWAT, it really is the case in terms of our ability to see new things here on Earth. Um, it, it really is a huge step forward for us. So again, I'm excited to kind of walk through it and kind of tell you a little bit about what it's doing and, and the measurements it's going to give us. All right. So SWAT is the, uh, what we kind of refer to it as the complete story of Earth's surface water. So when we say Earth's surface water, I'm not just talking about, say, lakes, rivers, and streams. I'm also talking about what's in the ocean. So SWAT is, is able to see all of these different features. Um, it's able to see the ocean in much higher detail than ever before. It's able to see more rivers and lakes and streams than we've ever been able to uh, to observe before. Um, and it can do this on global scales, right? It's a satellite. It's not focused on any one area. It's observing these things everywhere. Um, and really importantly, too, so, so I study sea level. I do a lot of work with coastal flooding. SWAT's going to give us really new information at that coastal interface, too. So it's going to tell us a lot of stuff about flooding in the future and how sea level is evolving, how our coastlines are evolving. So it's really exciting. It's going to cover hydrology. It's going to cover oceanography, but also that interface in the coastal regions. And I'm going to step through each of those uh, just with a few slides here um, and then happy to take questions. Um, but to start out, I think uh, just to show the uh, launch of SWAT, I'm not going to show all of this. I'm just going to mute as well. But um, so SWAT launched late last year. Just to give you an idea of, of the, the time frame here. So it was launched on December uh, 16th from Vandenberg Space Force Base uh, at about 3.46 a.m. in the morning. So it was uh, nice and early, a night launch. My family did uh, manage to stay awake and come see the launch as well, which was cool. Um, but everything went well. The SWAT launched. Um, this is a, just a video of that launch. And in a second, before I cut it off, you'll see the um, deployment of SWAT or the, the release of SWAT from the, um, the, the space vehicle here. Um, but it's still relatively recent, so, so that's this is also to provide some context for what I'll cover. Um, I'm not going to be showing you a lot of data, obviously, from SWAT because it's up there. We're still under undergoing um, some of the calibration validation, some of the commissioning, and some of the additional steps here. But I will certainly point to what is to come and give one little highlight of some of the initial data that's been released, what we call first light. Okay. 
So now that we've seen that, to get into what SWAT actually is, I want to step back. So this is not SWAT, um, but this is um, these conventional satellite radar altimetries, which you may or may not have, have heard of, but this is the JSON series of radar altimeters, these nadir pointing, uh, what we call nadir pointing altimeters. And the reason we call them nadir pointing, sorry, I keep stopping this animation just so I can point things out. They are essentially measuring directly below the satellites as they orbit around the Earth, right? So there's a ground track that these satellites have. They send a radar pulse down to the surface of the ocean and then time how long it takes for that pulse to get back. If you do a whole bunch of environmental corrections, you can get to a re really accurate measurement of sea surface height from these altimeters. And I'll just play this forward here. Um, so Sentinel-6, uh, it's skipping forward, I mean, in a weird way. Sentinel-6, uh, Michael Freilich was launched in 2020 um, and is the next in a, in the um, a series of 30 year of satellite altimeters that, that have been launched by NASA and partners. But you can see exactly how these measurements are made. Um, a long track measuring direct, directly below the satellites. This is what that 10 day ground track looks like. So every 10 days that track gets repeated. If you do some interpolation and fill in some of these gaps, you can get an image that looks like this of sea surface height. Um, so the reason I, I want to mention this is to just lay the ground for why SWAT is different and how it's in advance. And I have one more slide here. So this is, again, the conventional altimetry and just what it actually looks like and the data that we're collecting looks like from these conventional altimeters, what we've had over the last three decades. Um, so this is just uh, going up through time. So every, every 10 days, we repeat this track, as I said, and you can see all these features moving in the ocean you start to get a sense of very small features moving in the ocean. We know not everything is large scale. There's some really detailed things happening, very small scale um, ocean features, what we call eddies, fronts, things like that, that, that are actually really important to our understanding of the climate system and of the ocean. And the other thing you can see here is that there are, are big black spots, gaps between these ground tracks. So there, there are things that we're missing. And if I were to zoom in on the coast in this particular um, animation here, you would see that these conventional altimeters do not get us right up to the coast because of how they're doing these, um, making these observations. So there, are, with what we've had to date before SWAT, there have been a lot of these gaps. Okay, so enter SWAT. And, and this is uh, what I want to talk to you today about um, this SWAT, uh, the Surface Water and Ocean Topography Mission. This is what SWAT looks like. This is an animation, and I'm going to play a similar view to what I showed for Sentinel-6, and you'll you'll immediately see how this is different, right, and how the observation that's being made is different. So it uses something called the Ka band radar interferometer. So it's a, a different way of measuring sea surface height and, and water height here on Earth. It measures in a swath. So no longer are we measuring along one individual track. We're actually measuring in a swath. Each of these swaths are about 30 miles wide. So it's two swaths. There's a gap in between that gets filled in by a nadir pointing altimeter. So one of those conventional radar altimeters. And then every 21 days between 78 degrees north and south, we get this complete view of the ocean. And it's a little difficult to see in this animation, but we're actually measuring um, some of the, the rivers and the lakes here as well. They're kind of filled in in blue. You see some of these features here. But SWAT is able to, with that SWAT, you no longer have those gaps between ground tracks. You're getting much closer to the coast, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and we're able to see much finer scale features, right? So if you're looking in a SWAT, um, you're able to see in, in those two dimensions, you're able to see a full eddy, for instance, as opposed to when you're just measuring a long track, you're just kind of sampling the height of that as you, as you pass over it. So we're getting much more detailed information uh, with SWAT in the SWAT measurement. Okay. And then one additional way of looking at this. So this is a, a this is simulated ocean data. And what we've done here is basically flown satellite altimeters over it. And starting with CSAT, which was a, an altimeter launched in the 1970s, and moving up through GeoSat, which was launched in the 80s, the JSON series, which kind of takes us to the last three decades, and up to SWAT. And as this plays, I want you to just see how the the resolution, how the detail changes over the ocean as we go through time. So again, starting out with CSAT, this is what we had back in the 1970s. Um, this is interpolated, so we would have those uh, um, ground tracks uh, if, if we were to show them. But this is GeoSat. So this is, you can see there's some improvement from the 70s to the 80s. And then we're going to have the JSON series that started with Topex Poseidon. Again, you're getting um, more and more detail. It's like you're putting on glasses. You're at the eye doctor and he's adjusting that prescription. We're getting more and more detail. And then finally, we have SWAT, which uh, gives us this whole new 
unprecedented view of the ocean. You can see how many features SWAT is going to be able to pull out um, over the ocean. Um, we get this question a lot. Why are these small scale features important? Right. So it's great that we are observing something that we haven't observed before. But why does that really matter? There's a lot of reasons that it matters. Um, sorry, one, this slide, um, just a, another way of, of showing these smaller scale features. Um, again, this is simulated data um, using uh, something called Echo, but you can get these high resolution features that are happening. So why are these features important? Um, one, as you get closer to the coast, these can play an important role in driving the sea level change or the coastal sea level variability near shore that can really be and that, um, among the most impactful in, in terms of what we're feeling at the coast. But beyond that, the ocean right now is really doing a very important job of taking that heat that's getting trapped by the atmosphere and absorbing a lot of it. So about 93%, uh, I think the estimate's a little closer to 90% of the warming that is getting trapped um, due to uh, increased greenhouse gases is going into the ocean. And these smaller scale features actually play a really important role of taking that um, heat in at the surface and then communicating it and, and uh, mixing it with the rest of the, the ocean, the other layers, and then getting it down into layers so it gets fully absorbed. So under climate change, as climate change continues to go on, there is some concern that the ocean will become less efficient at absorbing this heat, right? Um, and as that, if that were to happen, then you'd start to have more of that heat going elsewhere, going to the atmosphere and warming things, going onto land. Um, and it would really change just how the earth is responding to ongoing climate change. So it's really critical that we understand these processes at the smaller scales and how they're causing this vertical mixing and this mixing of heat and the absorption of heat. Um, so there are a lot of reasons that we're very interested in these small scales um, and, and really good reasons to be trying to observe them beyond just like they're there. We want to understand ocean circulation better. They play a really critical role uh, within our, our the earth system's response to ongoing warming. All right. Um, and then I already mentioned the SWAT is going to provide much better information in coastal regions. So again, another animation. It's a consistent thing. I'm showing a lot of animations, not real data here, but um, this is the uh, Mississippi Delta region. And you can see that as SWAT flies over the simulated data, you have the swath, that red line is that nadir pointing altimeter measurement that kind of fills in the swath, but it sees right up to the coastal interface and into the coastal interface, right? We know that it can measure lakes, rivers, reservoirs, which I'll talk about in just a second, but we're able to see through this interface and really provide new information about where water is and how it's moving and areas where it is most important to people living at the coast, right? So I can certainly tell them what sea level rise, for instance, will be in the open ocean, hundreds of kilometers offshore and say that this is likely to be what you feel um, along the Gulf Coast of the United States. Um, but until you have a good understanding of how the ocean water is moving in these coastal areas and how it's interacting with um, with, with other features in these coastal areas, you, you really can't provide the kind of information they need to plan for what, what might be coming in the future. So SWAT's going to really provide a really important information in what is currently a data gap. All right, so now to shift to um, hydrology. So I've talked about what's happening in the ocean along the coast. SWAT is also going to provide measurements over land, right? So it's going to see on a global scale rivers, lakes, and reservoirs in details that in detail that we've never been able to before. Um, so this here is a study that came out a couple of years ago, basically saying how many times, given SWAT's orbit and, and the measurements it's making, how many times is it going to see different segments of rivers on a global scale each year? And you see that some of these um uh, rivers in, in Europe in particular are going to be observed hundreds of times over the course of the year. Um, most of the other locations, you're looking more in kind of the 20 to 30 uh, region. Um, but being able to see these rivers in this detail on a global scale is really unprecedented, right? In order to monitor what happens with the water flowing in these rivers, you need gauges, you need in situ measurements, you need surveys, things like that. Very labor intensive and difficult things to do, especially in very remote parts uh, of the world. But now with SWAT, you're going to be able to get those measurements from space. They'll be publicly available to anyone that needs them. And you're going to get this regular monitoring over time. And it's really going to improve our understanding of flooding, of um, water resources, how it changes over the course of the year and how it's changing over time as climate continues to change. Um, so again, uh, just uh, I use the word game changer, right? It's something that we just have not had before on this scale and this level of detail. All right, now if we think about lakes, 
Um, actually, stepping back here, uh, I just want to give an idea of the, the resolution of SWAT. So SWAT is actually going to be able to measure rivers that are at least 100 meters in width. So we're going to be able to see very small features. Um, and you can see the full extent, uh, the full reach of those rivers. But you're going to be able to see pretty small features from space. And then if we shift to lakes, um, so it's a similar message, right? We're going to be able to see these lakes um, on a global scale, be able to monitor lakes and reservoirs that have not been able to, we've not been able to monitor before. The size of the lake we'll be able to get to is roughly 10 acres. That's the, the general um, thought right now with the SWAT data, we'll be able to see features that are that small. Um, and uh, yeah, so a SWAT on a global scale, we'll be able to see millions and millions of lakes um, and be able to track the changes that are occurring from year to year. All right, so I made the, uh, the the comment here about the ability to monitor the um, the river. So if we look at the Mississippi River, and we can see that certain parts of the river are gauged, right? So in this location here at the top, you have a gauge where you can monitor the the height of the river um, over time, but um, in other areas you have no measurement, right? Where you have all these question marks, there, there are important things that as the rivers flood, as things start to change over time, you have no visibility as to what's happening in these locations. SWAT's gonna be able to fill in these gaps, right? And we get the question sometimes, I mean, how is this different than what some of the other satellites that have previously been used to, to look at rivers and lakes? What is different about SWAT? And the key thing here is that SWAT is actually measuring height. Right? It's measuring the height of the water. So it's not just measuring the area or the spatial extent of the rivers, lakes, and reservoirs. It's measuring the height. So we can actually track volume changes through time. Right, So you don't just need to know the width of the river, but you actually know how much water is flowing through the river um, at any given period of time and how that volume is changing. Um, so that's a really important thing here. So it's it's area, it's the width, but it's also the height, right? And that's obviously important when we're talking about the ocean too, we're actually measuring the ocean height. Okay, and then one more way of looking at this. So another reservoir, um, as I mentioned, you there, there are other satellites that you can use to track the area of reservoirs, which is, is typically how water management is done on, uh, over large scales. At, these, at this point, but with SWAT, you're actually going to be able to tell the height of those, um, those reservoirs as you change through time. And just a simple example of why that's important. So if you think about a case where you have very steep sides of a reservoir or a lake, um, you may not have a good idea just looking at the area, how much that water level is going up or down. But with SWAT, you're actually seeing that change in water surface height and then can actually get an understanding of volume. So it takes out some of the uncertainty um, when you start to think about how to, to manage the water resources that are in our, res our reservoirs across the globe. Okay. Um, so another animation here about what SWAT will see. So this is flying over the Connecticut River uh, in the Northeast US. And this is what SWAT will look like over time. So these colors actually represent um, height of the water. So this is for a flood event, if I step back here a little bit, so you can see upstream, I'll pause it in a second, but upstream of the, the river, you can see that some flooding has occurred. So there's a, sorry, clicking the wrong direction here. Skip forward. I'll pause. All right, so you can see that at this stage that the um, ocean, or the, the river has expanded in, um, in its width, right? And that those colors, uh, show the height. So where you have red, these this is a very high uh, amount of water that's in the river at this point. And you can we can see over time with SWAT how this then propagates downstream down the river as it continues to fly by. Um, so we'll be able to track exactly how the water is moving in these rivers, be able to understand how much is there, how it changes over time. Um, so so really, again, just highlighting this is measuring height and, and really, really important. And we're trying to understand the movement of water between uh, land and ocean land in our coastal areas. Okay, so just to wrap up here, then I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions. So there is a lot of work being done on uh, applications related to SWAT. So there is an early adopter program that has been set up. So this is a group that has been working alongside the SWAT project for a, a couple of years now to be ready to take the SWAT data once it's available. So there are a wide range of applications. Some of these are water resource management. Uh, some of them are, are very interested in what's happening along coastal regions, um, but they all have their own particular application or use case. 
and they're ready to take that SWAT data in. So this is an important part of the SWAT project to really be able to prepare people to hit the ground running once the SWAT data becomes available. Um, and, and these applications span a wide range. I, I think that given what I showed in some of those animations, you could start to imagine what some of these applications are. Uh, but understanding flooding, both in coastal regions, but also on land, understanding climate change, marine operations, fisheries, coastal zone management, all of these um, SWAT will provide relative, relevant information for. Okay, so what is the status of SWAT right now? So SWAT is currently on orbit. It is collecting data. We are about to enter into the calibration phase, the calibration and validation phase. It's been um, in a commissioning phase to date and, and making sure everything checks out. Um, it is currently in a calibration and validation orbit. So it's a one day repeat orbit. So not the final orbit that it will be in what we call the science orbit. Um, but this really allows us to, to understand the measurements that are being made um, within uh, by the SWAT data and how it compares to what's on land. So each of those little indicators there on the right, those different colored dots, show some in situ or on the ground campaign that is taking place or measurement that's being made that SWAT can then be compared against. And we'll be able to get a very good understanding both in the ocean and also on land of the the quality of the observation, the spatial scale that we're actually able to resolve, all this additional information that'll prepare us once we shift to that full science orbit. Um, the plan is to shift to the science mission on uh, in mid-2023, uh, so around the summer of this year. The data is targeted to become publicly available in late 2023. So again, some of the, da the data is being collected now, but um, given all the work that needs to be done in advance of the, the public release, we're looking at kind of a late 2023 release. Um, you can keep up with the mission at swat.jpl.nasa.gov. There's a lot of uh, updates that are being pushed there, and you can check on the latest status. And then the last step here, and I will end with this, that uh, I think it was just last week, the first light of SWAT, the first SWAT data was released in a press release by NASA and uh, international partners showing uh, some of the data. So everything I've showed you up to this point has been simulated data. This is actual SWAT data that has been collected off the East Coast of the United States. Um, and this is a uh, SWAT flying over the Gulf Stream. So you can actually get a, a view of some of the variability and some of the smaller scale features that um, the SWAT is able to resolve. Um, there isn't too much to say about this to date, other than I think it is looking really good. Uh, everybody's very positive about these um, first initial returns. Those little dots in the middle, that's the nadir pointing altimeter. Um, that's not actually how it's measuring. It's just to, to visualize that um, we, we do have this measurement in the middle of those two SWATs. But, um, everything's checked out well, well, the nadir altimeter is working well, the um, SWAT swath measurement is working well, and we are very excited about what is to come. And with that, I will leave it there and happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Ben. Uh, you definitely did your work. <laughs> as, as I mentioned that uh, Margaret highly recommended you. So thank you for presenting to us. Um, you have, we have lots of questions, both in English and in Spanish. Um, so I'd like to thank Rebecca for responding to, to Anna uh, from Argentina in Spanish. Um, so I'll try to get to as many questions as I can, but if we run out of time, please feel free to check the chat box and see if we can answer some of them. Uh, we have one question regarding the simulated data. I just want to know what is simulated data and, and how is it used? Yeah, so simulated data, it, it's maybe the wrong way to, to say it. I did use that word a lot, but so it's actually from a, a reanalysis product that um, is run out of JPL, the ECHO product. So with uh, ECHO, it's the estimating circulation, and I'm going to forget, of the ocean. So basically, it's, it's looking at the circulation of the ocean at very high resolutions, and we can generate data that's based or generate simulated or reanalysis data that's based on real data but add some additional detail based on our understanding of the physics. So we can get really good, um, good high resolution measurements that allow us to do some of these kind of sampling things where we fly a satellite over it and see what we could resolve and, and do some different, uh, different activities. Thank you. And I know you mentioned this earlier, but remind us what is the resolution of SWAT again compared to the previous altimeters? Yep. So over the ocean, SWAT can um, get us measurements down to about 10 to 15 kilometers. So it can resolve features that are about 10 to 15 kilometers. Previous altimeters were on the order of hundreds of kilometers, or you would have to take multiple altimeters. There are, there are quite a few of these nadir pointing altimeters on orbit and then find ways to combine those 
um, with different kind of statistical analysis and data analysis techniques, but it's it's almost an order of magnitude better with SWAT over the ocean. And then over land, it's about 100 meter width for rivers and about 10 acres for lakes. Wow, as you mentioned, game changer there. That, that's a big yeah. difference. Um, another question um, is, have there been any early adopters for SWAT uh, using simulated data? Yep, so um, there, there was quite a bit of work done to provide simulated SWAT data. So there, there is a particular tool that was created early on. Um, that is what the early adopters are currently working with now, just to understand exactly what they might have over their particular location. Um, so they are doing some work there, nothing definitive. Again, they're, they're all kind of preparing for actually using the, the SWAT data once it comes. Gotcha. And here's here's a bit of a tongue twister for you. Uh, what is SWAT SWAT? Yeah, that is a, a tongue twister. Um, so it, it is uh, thirty miles. Each SWAT, each of the two SWATs, is about thirty miles in in width. Gotcha. And and the images that you showed, um, the images that we'll be getting back from SWAT, are free for all to to obtain. Correct. Exactly. Uh, quite a bit of effort is going in both on the the U.S. side and also with the international partners in Europe to provide the data freely, but also to provide tools that make it easy to work with that data. Um, so it's not like there's going to be a huge data dump of just a bunch of data sets that are very difficult to start to use in your application. There, there's also efforts being put into place to actually provide simple analysis tools or visualization tools where someone could go in and look at the SWOT data very quickly. That's awesome because we often work with uh, teachers and students and they want to use NASA data to do research. Uh, so it's great to hear that there's going to be something that's going to be a bit more user friendly for them. Right. Yeah. Um, another question we have is how are ocean simulations used uh, and compared to those in the rivers? Is information available for small rivers as well? Yep. So it, it is, I guess it depends on your, the, taking that last part first, it depends on your definition of small, I suppose. Um, but we'll be able to see rivers that are about 100 meters in width, potentially a little bit smaller than that. But that's kind of the, the target is um, any river that is 100 meters or more in width. Um, but yeah, the, the ocean simulations, I, they, they really do provide us an opportunity with understanding what we might see from satellites. Um, so one, one way in particular, when, when you're developing a mission, you think about the orbit that you're going to put the satellite into, and that impacts the how frequently you're going to measure something, that the temporal resolution, that return time of the satellite. So we can take that simulated data, fly a satellite over it before we even launch it and try to understand exactly what that observation is going to be that we can get back out. So um, those ocean simulations assist missions in, in that way. Scientifically, so ECHO, that, that one I, I mentioned in particular, it, is just, it supports all kinds of different science applications because it is based on the real world. If we're kind of backwards looking, um, it is it is it's simulated data it's not real observations but it's based on observational data and has real physics in it so it's it's a very useful product just to support science in general gotcha okay well we have a couple questions left and a lot of wow cool uh just comments in there as well so people really enjoyed your, your slides um one question is uh the person is saying i'm wondering the signal returned only include height info on the water or uh, does it also include the height for others like ground height or the tree height? Yep, so um, I did think that that question might come up given kind of the, the focus of this group. Um, so so the, the way SWAT observes, we're only collecting observations of surface water, right? So seeing, the, I guess as a starting point, seeing the water is different than what you might see on land and then how you then process the data. Also the KA band, um, altimeter that or the the ke band interferometer that SWAT uses is not going to be particularly useful for seeing um canopies or or tree heights i believe it i'm not an expert in this but i believe it, it penetrates the canopy height pretty well um so the short answer is SWAT's not going to give any information over land or about uh trees in particular gotcha okay so two more questions um i say two more and then just keep coming but i think it's two more for now um Regarding the simulated data, the reanalysis data that you mentioned, um, does the simulated uh, become the hypothesis uh, when the sensor goes into orbit? Um, no, so uh, that that is a good question. It it does not. So what we observe uh, and the the measurements we get from SWAT are kind of taken as is and independently, right? So we do a lot of work with calibration validation with with different measurements on um, on land, but yeah, you know, we're not using that reanalysis product or echo to do anything to the observational data. 
that uh, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, we try to keep the observations independent, understand exactly what the satellite is providing us, and then yeah, try to to provide context with uncertainties and and uh, the different corrections that are needed through comparisons to other things. Thank you. And, and the person who asked that question actually just write, wrote, thank you very much for that uh, the answer that you gave earlier. Okay, so um, uh, last question um, comes from Bob Cook. Over geologic times, what's the impact of oceans uh, rising on river height? Yep, that's uh, a good question. Um, I'm not going to have a good answer to that, to be honest with you. I mean, it, there, there must be... Um, it, over very large time scales, right? The transfer of water between land and ocean varies significantly. How much water gets captured and stored in ice covered areas, all that stuff is going to be a factor. So it's actually, I, I think I could reinterpret your question as like a fundamental one of like, where is water and, and how does that change over time? And where does it get stored on land? So um, I'll just say that's a good question. And uh, I don't have, <laughs> have a, a quick short answer for you. That's still an answer. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Uh, when, one last question is, when will the data be available? We understand it goes through. I think just cut out. I did get the uh, the question, though, about when the data will be available. So, so it will be a bit. Yeah. yeah. I, I got you, though. Um, yeah, so it'll be available late this year. Um, I don't know the exact date. It still depends on, on kind of checking everything out. But um, yeah, I, I would say best case or a good case would be September um, of this year. That's, that's kind of been thrown around, but uh, yeah, as soon as we can get it out, that will be the date. Awesome. Well, thank you very much once again for presenting to us and sharing uh, the awesome things that SWAT is doing. And thank you for sharing a bit about yourself as well. Um, I think that's pretty much it for the questions there, but there may be a couple more, but once again, thank you very much for joining us today and presenting to us. Yeah. Thanks for the invite. All right. I'd turn it over to Brian. All right. Uh, thank you, Ben, for that uh, great presentation. So looking forward to hearing more about SWAT um, in the near future and extended future as well. So I'm going to pop back to my uh, slide presentation and um, we will move on. Oh, didn't want to do that. Not from the start. Sorry. All right. So I'm going to pass it over to Peter Nelson in a second because he's going to uh, talk a little bit about um, with his presentation, um, you know, add a little bit of information into the uh, about the one week uh, tree height and land cover intensive observation period, which we ran from Tuesday, the 21st of March, which was International Day of Forest through uh, the Tuesday, the 28th of March. And as you mentioned, this is the one week and we are trying to do a combination of these combined uh, data sets in a particular area. So, you know, of course, we had the origin point where you would stand and take an observation of the tree. But before you do the tree observation, we ask for you to do a land cover observation with a glow observer. And then do take your tree height observation. And when you get to the base of the tree, you submit that tree height observation or just save it, whatever, um, and then submit it later. And then at that end point, which would be at the base of the tree, you would take another land cover observation. And this would allow us to understand exactly that area with those different data points from land cover to tree height to land cover in that specific you know pixel space so with that said you know through this time and peter will dive further into this uh, i i went on to uh, globe viz and this is just the global map of the tree height and land cover data that came in during this one week period and you can see it spread out pretty well throughout the uh the globe community uh, in, in all these different countries. So the green, of course, would be the tree height and the, the brown color would be the land cover observations. Um, so, you know, great number here. And with that said, I'm going to pass it over to our own Peter Nelson. And as you know, I'm going to give him a formal introduction, though. He is a researcher, you know this, at the College of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University. And you know he is the land cover science lead for the Globe Observer. He's based in Corvallis, Oregon in the United States. And he's gonna to talk to you uh, with a combination of, you know, what we just heard from, from uh, Dr. Hamlington, you know, and, and focusing on, you know, the water bodies and looking at edges. He's gonna talk riparian trees, changing water bodies and a discussion of the upcoming May 2023 edge challenge. So Peter, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Excellent. 
thank you so much, Brian. I appreciate the nice introduction and um, and and learning about some of the new science that is happening at NASA. That um, you know, as you heard, there's a lot of preparation, a lot of learning from past missions, a lot of past research that has gone into deciding on this particular sensor. And one of the things that intrigued me is that um, one of the numbers I heard is that currently this uh, the surface water ocean topography mission is producing about 40% of all of the data that NASA and, um, and, and, and partners are downloading from space. So imagine this. I mean, we've been collecting a lot of information, but here we're going to really be able to take it up and have 40% um, uh, of, of everything that's coming down is related to this particular question of where is the water? And, um, and, and that whole thing, question about height, I find really fascinating uh, because it gets into this question of what are we referencing ourselves to? And that to me gets into one of the reasons why we are particularly using the satellite platforms to make these measurements. Mount, uh, you know, uh, uh, all of our, a lot of our mountains where we are uh, using uh, for height reference in some cases are changing over time. Um, and, and then, you know, when we relate ourselves to sea level, right, uh, lowest elevation, what we're hearing from scientists is that that level is changing and going up. And we just kind of heard a little bit about how that isn't the same all over the world. Um, and so, you know, this is an ongoing question that, that scientists have been, just been working on for a long time because it does relate to all of us here on Earth, right? This water cycle, where is the water? When is the water in your area? Just a very fundamental piece, right? Um, and uh, and so, so, you know, part of the reason why, why Brian and I and Peter Falcon wanted to bring up this 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 idea of doing repeat measurements using actually the globe observer um, as a way of actually recording where some of the edges are whether it be water edges uh, whether it be edges like what's behind me where you can see that there's actually gravel bars be at this time of the year but right next to it is is water and if I went back, this, you know, at another time, this might actually be flooded out like we saw in those measurements. And so when, when we think about um, rivers, we want to also be thinking about what is along the edges of those rivers. Because this is one of those areas that previously has caused us a lot of problems from space. If the sun isn't high enough in the sky, those trees will actually cast a shadow and we won't see exactly where this edge is. Again, depending on where you are, where the sun is um, and where the satellite is amongst all of that. So that's one reason why going out and, and helping us get these reference points using a mobile app like Globe Observer that records your location. It does some remote sensing um, and actually helps us to see how, what color is that water. And again, one of the things that I think is really important is that, you know, by going back to the same location, the only way that we can actually know how things change, you need two measurements, you, 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 can, you can go back and, and we can use these photos to actually see, well, do we see the same features? In this case, is that gravel still there or not? And, um, and by starting to put together our ground photos, we can actually help provide insights, even if it's just a rough estimate, right? It sort of, it, it helps scientists who are looking at those height differences. They can look at our photos and go, oh, okay, there's that tree before. Oh, now it's flooded full of water. Okay, it, that, it, we're capturing the phenomena, the thing that we're really trying to capture. So ground photos like, we, like uh, of land cover, is a really important way that we can contribute, especially as we think about this data that's being currently collected um, and the, the resolution, because that 100 meter width of the river is about the size of our globe sites, right? About 100 meters. And so when we're thinking about our land cover and when we're thinking about 
Um, is this a is this an area that I can clearly identify and label as trees, or I can I can I can actually uh, 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 clearly identify that as all water, 100 meters? That gives us that spatial area, right? So we know 100 meters by 100 meters gives us a thousand square meters. That gives us the area. What's exciting about SWAT and some of the, the globe measurements that we can make is we can add the volume to that, exactly like what we're doing with our tree height estimate to grow that pixel upwards. How tall, what is the structure and what is happening in that vertical component? And so radar is one way that we're doing it and, and are able to do it. Um, and there's lots of resources to read about that. But LIDAR and what we've been talking about with ISAT-2, the JEDI satellite from our last presentation, is another way. And I'll mention that when you look at radar data, not this particular one, but other radar data, there is a question about um, and, and, a, and, and a challenge that occurs when water is sitting at the surface and then you have trees with their canopy in the top. That can actually bounce the signal around in the same way that visible light is kind of absorbed and, and makes a shadow, just like what is sort of happening over here, right? Darker pixels, darker areas, right? So that again kind of goes into why was that wavelength per, per, chosen and selected for this particular mission, okay? so. That is a little bit of, of, uh, uh, of making some connections between what we, what we were wanting to do and what, uh, what uh, we're able to actually uh, 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 work with. Let me see here. And I'm gonna stop that sharing again and try it one more time. Okay. All right, hang on really quick. It's telling me my screen sharing's paused. Uh, all right. So let, while I'm kind of fiddling around here getting my screen set up, let me ask um, in, the, in, the, in the chat, how many people actually went out and, and did this coincidence set of measurements? Um, and that will help us in our conversation a little bit too. Um, and Brian showed us some numbers, so it wasn't just me, which I'm really excited about because I was only I only did three of those at the time. Uh, and so uh, drop in the chat if you wouldn't mind uh, if you actually participated and might have collected the type of data that we're talking about here. Right. So Brian, let me ask really quick. Um, are you what screen are you seeing right now? I just see a black screen. Ah, perfect. All right. Yeah. Okay, there it is. Resume share. Right. Let's see if it actually does it. Sorry about this, everyone. Technical problems, right? And if I need to, I'm just going to go like that. All right. There you go. All right, success. <laughs> Gotta love this, you know. So, so I wanted, I wanted to highlight, you know, there was a lot of remote sensing science, physics, um, uh, and maps, and a lot of terms that that were brought up. And so I want to highlight for all those teachers and students out there, go take a tour of the electromagnetic spectrum and look into that KA radar band. What 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 does that KA mean? It's a really it's a it's a it's a something that doesn't really make a lot of sense because it doesn't tell you about the wavelengths that we're actually measuring here. There's a reason for all of that, but I just want to mention that it's worthwhile getting into this because 
the type of information that's being recorded here is slightly different than what we've been talking about. Um, so I want to highlight that because the whole thing of what can you actually do with the data goes back to understanding, well, what is actually getting measured here? How are they able to calculate height? What other characteristics might come with the shape of that wave that is coming back, right? So that is, is a particular thing that I, I, want, I want to highlight for everybody as a preface as we start thinking about this new satellite, this new measurements, and what's available to us. It takes a little bit of research. It's new to us. And, you know, and so, you know, this leads me into, um, you know, the way that we start to kind of think about the world. And I think one of the things that's really exciting about the SWAT mission is that 21 day repeat measurement around the globe that allows us to not just look at where water is at a point in time. And I wanna sort of highlight how important this land water interface really is. Um, and when you're zoomed out on a, on a map like this, the globe visualization map, we've got some stretching going on, um, but they're showing us uh, you know, where large water bodies are located. And these tend to be reference points from space that we reference our data to. Uh, it's one reason why uh, actually identifying that land water interface is really helpful because it, it, it can be, it's such an obvious line like what's behind me that they serve as really good reference points for other data that's, that we're trying to position in the right place on earth. Okay, so again, um, that's where you, when you zoom in, you start to see these smaller bodies of water. And I want to highlight that a map like this is showing us a point in time. Or uh, like here, where I'm lo located in the uh, western part of the United States, they're trying to imply to us that um, on the right here, Malheur Lake is the way that that's called, is always water. But right next to it, we actually have a vegetation line. What kind of vegetation? I don't really know. But there is this line here. And so one of the questions that SWAT is really helping us to understand is where is that line? How dynamic is it? When does it change? And how does it change? Um, the other thing is right here, we have Harney Lake. And there you see that there's some, some, some map symbology that's indicating here with these horizontal lines that this lake is sometimes there and then sometimes it's not really there. And so that is, is a really important characteristic where here we, again, don't know the timing, but we do know that sometimes the water's there, but sometimes the water's not there, okay? And I'm gonna finally end with all of the white area outside or a cream color is all the areas that are considered never water. That is the land that we're talking about. And what, we're ta and what we can demonstrate through this is actually this transition zone from always water where it's surface water, right? If you actually uh, measure the depth and the height of this, you would, you would actually have a three-dimensional characteristic there. Here, we're really just talking about the area. We have no idea how deep this lake is, right? But that's where remote sensing can come in and activate this map and turn it into something that is static, that's just giving us a little bit of information, like where the origin of our river is. Now, if I zoom in on this location, on this on this particular river, one of the questions that, that I know will be getting asked with the SWAT data is, is this river wide enough to actually be measured by that satellite? Okay, and here it's indicating this map, these map makers are telling us that here is the end of the river. And if we go out there, is that where we're gonna find the water? So this is, these, these upper parts of our river shed um, is, is, and watershed is a really important place for us to maybe put our efforts as the globe community. This is a really interesting area. And especially when we move to away from um, our thematic map 
to that satellite view, right? And so here, this is you know what we are used to seeing and we can actually delineate or see some of the water body here. Here is that river that they were talking about. And what I wanna highlight is they're, they're mentioning or showing on that other map that here is the beginning of the river. Well, what the heck is this thing on the other side of it, um, over on the right? And here in the side of the globe viz system, we can turn on the hybrid layer. And there we get the overlay where we can see the name of the river. And then we can also, you know, kind of follow it up. And so, you know, this is one way that you can start thinking about that view from space. What does our water look like? And this, these views, this satellite base map that we have on the globe this system is a static moment in time. When that time is, I don't know, doesn't tell us. We don't have that information, right? And so that again is one of these components that we really wanna kind of bring in to what we're doing and, um, and our, all of our activities, okay? So uh, again, I will hop in here and show you know, there is a variety of other information that goes right along this. And one thing that I will highlight is if you change your dates and look at something like the SMAP data, when you start looking at the soil moisture, some of what you're seeing is the combination of that water together with, um, you know, certain land cover types, including things that shade like trees that keep an area moist over time. Okay, so I'm excited about that. The other thing that's available to you inside of here to help us think about this water and tree connection is understanding the watersheds. How is water actually moving in our area? And so, you know, here I'll just kind of uh, turn on our very large to uh, our regional one, um, just to kind of give you a, a context there. And then importantly, when we are talking about that 100 meter area, that is that minimum size of the SWAT, but also the globe site size, turn on the map grid. Part of that map grid is actually that 100 meter area. It looks like a rectangle because we've got a round earth, but we've got a flat computer monitor, okay? So just kind of recognize there's some lots of interesting things that you can just explore here in this particular visual, you know, just using the Globe Viz site like this. So I'm gonna zoom out a little bit here because what I wanna highlight is how we can actually see this, this clear river as it goes through um, this particular area. And what that means is that that is, as we zoom back in, this area is exposed to sunlight, it means that the um, that many of the satellites can actually visibly see this water right there, um, and we can also see evidence of change um, of different water levels because at this point here is a gravel bar similar to a gravel bar like what's behind me, right? And those are the type of areas that sometimes get flooded out. Um, maybe the river actually at one point followed this whole pathway um, and, it, and it actually came into the river at this point. Or maybe there's some irrigation going on around here because of the land use that's happening. And so as we start looking at our river systems like this and thinking about the size of them and will they be seen from above, when they are smaller than that 100 meter area, that's where we really need to come in because as, as we were talking about, each of our sensors has a particular resolution. They won't be able to see a small river like this because it's not larger than 100 meters, right? But if I zoom out, we can actually see, you know, this, this river just uh, winding its way, winding its way. And, and it contrasts really, really well with the rest of the landscape. And so the shape gives us a hint that that's water. Even if we're zoomed out, 
And as we zoom out, we start to actually see um, here that larger body of water that I was highlighting earlier. That is always water. And here it is. This is that, that always water area. And then on the edge is, that, is the wetlands. And so you can see that by bringing the satellite imagery, there's just a lot more interesting things going on than the simple map that we were, that most people start off looking at. I also wanna highlight that over here, this lake is, is the one um, that we were looking at that is sometimes water. And uh, it's loading and so, one of the things that I'll highlight with this is changing the altitude changes the underlying map. And water is one of those that will change a lot on you as you're looking for the, as you're going in and zooming in on your particular location. Okay. So, uh, so I want to highlight that here. You can see that in this case, this is what, this is an area that is sometimes water or might be water but it's definitely a different color than this water over here that is more black, right? And I'll just give you a hint. It's because of the depth of the water, okay? And, 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 and that is exactly the kind of thing that the SWAT mission will be able to differentiate. Here, we can see the difference because of the color, right? And so here on the left, we have an area that is just a little bit more turquoise because the sunlight is actually reflecting off of the surface of this, of this soil, this white area with some water kind of above it. And then over here, it's just deeper water. It's always water. And so it actually is deeper and the sunlight goes down further. This is the same thing that happens as trees age. Okay, so why an area gets more green over time is similar to this water piece. The height of the, of, the, of the trees actually start absorbing more of that sunlight and it becomes darker, becomes shadier. You actually have to take your sunglasses off. When you take your photo, you have to think about um, how much light is there and, and do I have to slow my exposure down? right? You are, are, more of that light is being absorbed by that, by our tree canopy and in that area. If the trees are shorter, again, just like this, they're going to be reflecting a lot more of that light and it'll look a little bit green or blue like this, um, but it will be a lot, uh, a, a lot less than, than those taller trees. So it, this, this conversation about height, and yes, we've been focused on water, but there is the exact analog and the exact same thing that we're trying to do with water um, and measuring that height and, and with trees and, and, and the different land cover types that are out there, okay? So I, I, I wanted to, to highlight this because it's, it's really interesting when you start looking at some of these areas, for me, in, in, a, in an area that is really dry. And I'm gonna zoom in on this one and kind of end my little water talk here. Um, but what I wanna point out is that one of the things that we're seeing is the full extent, this white area of this, where the water used to be. It used to not just be over here on the left-hand side, it used to go all the way out it, with this white area. And we can actually see that there is, uh, as we zoom in on, on this area, we can actually see that there is some topography, some terrain that actually goes right in the middle that was the edge of this lake. So this to me, it, it happened over a long period of time. We don't have any remote sensing pictures of that over time. But it's one of those things that as we start to step back and look at things from the space perspective, we start to see the changes over time that when we actually go in and look at, say, our uh, land cover photos, you know, here we can actually go in and start to get a sense of what that area really looks like.
And here we can actually see what that edge of the old water body looked like. As we look east, this is that this is now um, an area that used to be full of water. And I'll zoom in a little bit here. Here's that white reflective area right there, uh, kind of towards the top of the screen. And, and this is that area that, again, at this point in time, was not covered by water. And again, we don't have any trees here, right? So why is that? Why are there no trees in this area? And part of that really does go back to, um, you know, here thinking about why this, uh, why this lake may not be there anymore, right? Why is it actually drying out over here? Might it not be really good for, for trees? Might not they be able to get their taproot down far enough to actually establish themselves? So there is this, this connection between these two things that, that, I, that I really wanted to kind of highlight, um, that connection between uh, trees and land cover uh, or, and, and, and the SWAT mission and our water bodies. And um, and so uh, you know I, I wanted to kind of just zoom out and give you a sense for the tools that you guys all have available to you right there. Okay, um, I also want to really focus on the other tool that 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 we want to help you identify where have people mapped water before, right? And um, and so here I'm going to zoom back in on the area that we were just kind of focusing in on. And it's right up here is, is that, that the two areas that we have been focused on. And to help us locate ourselves, I'll pull that back, right? So as I was highlighting, over on the right, we have our always water area. Then we have a wetland transition, which is this green area down to the lower left. And then we have our um, sometimes water, right? We can still see that water body, that, that, that bright area to the, to the edges there. Um, and so when we look at our land cover map in 2015, we can see that actually both our water bodies were documented as bare or sparse vegetation. We can see that there's some interesting areas that were mapped as, as maybe uh, um, forests, actually, as we zoom in on this. We can see that some of the wetlands were actually identified as forests. This is a common error that occurs in these land cover maps because that water body absorbs uh, sunlight just like a tree shadow does and just like a, a tall tree canopy does. So you will actually find a lot of the errors in, um, in land cover maps along those edges between water and trees. They won't get it right. And this is again where we can go in with our photos and, um, and kind of nail down where that edge actually is located. And if we go forward to say the year 2019, Wow, they actually labeled that as water. So even just across this four years between 2015 and 2019, our, our land cover map indicates that there was some, in, some changes here. And the area that was indicated as forest on the north side of this lake is now indicated as water, right? So that classification error is a common thing that uh, when you look at your location, you might see a similar sort of back and forth. Um, and, and so helping us to do our, our paired observations is one way that we can help with this discrepancy. Where is the tree line related to these edges of our rivers? Um, and are they, are they right up next to our, our, our water surface? And so, um, you know, I, I want to go to a really helpful tool that 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 I want I want you guys to use as part of this question as we start thinking about where is water in the landscape, because water is one of those things that changes where trees are at located on the edges 
of rivers, right? As was, high, as was highlighted earlier in the SWAT mission, part of that is seeing flooding events. This gravel bar actually at one point had trees on it, but there was flooding that occurred that, that took this river up 17 feet. And it, it actually scoured out those trees and it removed them and moved them literally downstream. And so the carbon moved from this location to a place down river somewhere. So this is a, a fun thing to do is when you're, when you're in along a river, if you're hiking along a river or just biking or doing anything like that, look for those down trees. Because if you see down trees along your river bank, that indicates that there was probably some flooding and you have carbon movement that is part of the hydrology cycle, right? And this is how things move from our headwaters, our mountains, actually all the way to the ocean. And it's this really interesting connection that you can see as you start to put together these pairs and start to think about this edge between our tree line and, uh, and, and our water line. So I'm gonna go in here and show you, uh, oh, not the data there. I'm sorry about that. That's how you can find out a little bit more. But if we click on this explore option, we can, again, you know, we get a map. We get some layers that tell us, oh, how often is that water there? And is it never water, sometimes water, or always water? Again, you know, this is a really important question that gets into why are trees located where they are? So I'm going to just, again, zoom in to our location that we've been focused on. And here, what we actually see is something that's closer to the reality. This is using the Landsat series of satellites. So we're uh, looking at annual changes. What has happened summer by summer? And we can see these blue areas as we zoom in, especially along this southwest edge, that's an area that's always water. And as it turns more into purple, you see an area that's less and less water. And, the, and, and as we go to this area that, you know, on, the, on our uh, uh, one map, it's actually showing us that it's sometimes water. And that's exactly what this is doing right here. It's showing us that sometimes this is water. And we can look at and actually get some information um, in here about when that occurs, how that occurs, some other things like that um, as you explore this particular um, you know, data set. One that's really, really helpful is at the very bottom, maximum water extent. Okay, so this is, this is where your paired observations really help and really come in handy. And so, you know, before we, we dive into what we actually created, I want, to, I want to highlight sort of, you know, what this map is showing us is at across 1984 to the year 2021, what was that highest level of water that is out there? And when we get the SWAT data, we can actually use a map like this to see is that what they're measuring um, the maximum water that's in the area, or is it smaller than that? And this is our flooding level, right? And so I, I will just highlight that you can zoom out and you really start to see areas that are very, very dynamic. And I'm going to go over here and zoom in on, uh, on some of these, you know, smaller areas to kind of highlight actually what's happening. As we zoom in on one of the areas that we were looking at earlier with SWAT data, the Mississippi River. Here we can actually see areas, oh, sorry, sorry. It's just kind of zooming back and forth on me. We can actually see the way that the river has changed course over time and when it was changing course like that, that flooding. And so, so actually using a layer like this to think about um, doing paired observations will again allow us to look at who is susceptible to flooding, what trees might be impacted by flooding, 
can they actually sustain uh, uh, the amount of water that might come at them um, at you know a confluence like this? And um, and and we will you will see that a lot of places have actually created uh, parks and open spaces around these areas that might flood where you could actually have a lot of tree changes. So I, I, I want to really, I'm, I'm kind of stressing this a lot because there's a lot of interesting things that tell us why trees are located where they are and why trees are not located where they are. And this particular data layer is one that is just really, really helpful. And you can do things like time travel on it. You can pull up the satellite base map and look at here where uh, where the where the water level is compared to where the trees are located. And so just exploring these edges, we can actually see that there is an edge line here between our trees um, and our water. And that flooding area is exactly what we're interested in trying to, trying to compare. What is the height of these trees at this location? And when we look back in time, did this forest actually extend back? Okay, that's Peter's uh, exploration of Landsat and time series and thinking about why we're uh, looking at, at, at paired observations and what we're actually finding um, with them. So uh, I went a little long with that because I got really excited after the presentation with the SWAT animations. And, um, I, but I wanted to highlight, you know, again, you can see here the dynamic between the water and the trees um, and, and even the height of those trees related to, the, to their proximity to the water. And that is something that is readily explored uh, all around us. So with that, I'm going to pop over. There's at least seven messages or so in the chat. So uh, I'm going to stop it right here. And Brian, Peter, come in and, uh, and cut me off. Hey, Peter, do you want to quickly mention the water challenge? And yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna put the link in the chat while you're talking about it, so people can check it out. Yeah. Okay. So um, part of the reason why uh, why I went on so long about this and why we were excited to bring in uh, our presentation today about the SWAT mission is because um, uh, we want to do a global globe program uh, uh, facilitated uh, a project that is recording where is the water in the month of May. Where is it located in your communities? And through our photos, we can quickly identify the state of the water, right? Just like the state of the trees. And, um, and so the whole goal is what you guys have been doing is go out with Globe Observer, stand on the edge where you might uh, be on the, on the shoreline, and then you might be looking out at, 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 at your water and help us to identify in May where is the water in your community? And again, that in certain places might be when the flooding is occurring. So please be safe. Don't you know, put yourself in danger just for science observations. Um, that's a really important thing. Um, and that is a, an advantage of using the Globe Observer land cover tool is it keeps you safe, whether it be hazards from trees or hazards from shorelines or other things like that. So. Um, stay a safe distance, but help us record where that water is located. Um, and um, and I will I actually will I will zoom in on a particular location that uh, that I noticed uh, came in um, from last year. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. And while and and um, because we had some really interesting observations come in. Uh, down here along this whole river system, we can actually see that that somebody went along and and recorded a bunch of, of photos of rivers, right? At different at, at 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 this point in time, right? And so here we can actually see that the trees have leafed out, so we have green up, green down, right? We also see some standing dead trees in this picture. And then we can see some shrubs over the gravel bank that indicate that there was some flooding. 
So that is, you know, an example that, that, uh, you know, one person did going along a whole river system here um, that was uh, pretty interesting uh, to, to just go, go in and look at over time. And, um, and so, we, you know, again, our goal here is to, uh, you know, connect you to places and how they might be changing over time. And it, when we're thinking about trees, they are so connected to the temperature of the water and, um, and the habitat for our locations. I bring this one up because one of the things that is in the past, there was actually a road that used to go across this. And so you can see the impact of prior human activity even in some of these locations because humans love water. And so we've done a lot of interesting things to water. So please document to us what we've been doing, how we've been shading the river, how we've been not shading the river, what's been going on with uh, the water in your community. And join us for our challenge May 1st to the 31st, specifically really thinking about where is the water so that we can be part of that SWAT mission and maybe some people here, as we saw, are interested in becoming some early adopters when that public data comes out. If you could start collecting data right now, you will have something to compare to whatever comes out in the future. So um, that's my uh, quick encouragement to join us in this um, uh, in this data in this particular da data challenge of where is the water. All right, thank you, Peter. And thank you for going through the, the online tools and really showcasing how important those, you know, looking at that one, the change over time from when you're looking at the 2015, you know, even to a couple years later and see this vast difference in how things are identified from literally one year to the next. So um, yeah, and your obs everyone's observations, you know, as part of this, uh, where's the water, you know, data challenge are super important for us understanding, you know, everything a little bit better. So. Um, thank you, Peter, for that. Um, I'm going to uh, end it with one last thing here. As I mentioned earlier, we have uh, the NASA Science Activation Program. We have a survey that I sent out a couple of weeks ago. And if you filled it out, that's awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. But I'm going to pop the link in the chat here again. And let me share my screen just to show you what it, when you go to it, um, basically what you're going to see. You're going to see this. Um, it's going to basically be a description of, you know, what the survey is and its uses of NASA assets, which, you know, as part of the science activation group, you know, a lot of what we do with the NASA Earth Science Education Collaborative or NESIC, that's what this campaign is part of and a lot of the other campaigns like Mission Mosquito and other programs as well. Um, you know, it's about a 15 to 20 minute survey. So, you know, feel uh, feel free and you know, if you want to be contacted by the investigator doing the um, actual survey and looking at the survey results, it's great. Um, and this is NASA assets, you know, can, as you can see, it could be anything from looking at the data sets, which Peter has talked about, some of the NASA data sets, images, data visualizations, which many of you have used, you know, as part of this campaign and other campaigns and stu your student research with our IVSS you know, looking at your own research, creating posters and publications, things like that. So um, the questions are pretty generalized. Some of them might get a little specific if you, depending upon how you answer them. So, you know, when you know, I'm just going to hit agree here and, you know, what you get here is, you know, you just get, you know, um, you know, kind of a drop down menu of some of the things, you know, which is the one you work with the most and, and things like that. So, um, you know, feel free to do that. Uh, it's, it's not mandatory, but we greatly appreciate if you do that because it would really help us out, you know, um, with uh, the programs that, that we're doing at NASA and beyond. So, um, but this is primarily with NASA assets, but as you know, the NASA assets filter, filter out into lots of other things like, of course, the GLOBE program and lots of other programs around the world. So I just want to say thank you all so much for uh, attending the webinar today. We had a great audience here from um, I'm looking at my, my data here, you know, we had about 10 countries present, so that's awesome. Um, also, thank you uh, once again to Dr. Ben Hamilton for his amazing presentation on SWAT and all the great questions um, that uh, Peter went through that all of you asked in the chat as well. So great questions and thank you, Peter, for 
for as always for uh, looking at the online tools and showing how we look at this data, you know, um, you know, over time in specific areas and what looking at it locally, how that has an effect globally. And, you know, make sure you uh, you take a look further at the the uh, water, the uh, where is the water uh, data challenge um, that's coming up very soon, coming up next beginning of next month in May. So thank you all so much. And I'm going to stop the recording right now.